Good morning and welcome to Union Church. My name is Mark Hunt, the pastor here, and it's great to be with you on this Lord's Day as we worship and glorify Him together. So this is the, the third sermon that I am going to be preaching in a, a short series we're in. It's called Gospel, Godliness, and Community. And we've looked at how the, the gospel is the most important thing. And last week we looked at how godliness is possible because of, of God's spirit and power at work within us. And today we're going to look at community. What does it take? What does it look like? to be in Christian community together. Okay? All right, a few head nods there, thank you. So um, to begin, I wanna share what I think is some really interesting data with you. There was a study done, it's a little bit of an older study, but it was a study done, it was done in the US, so I know culturally there may be some, some variations with that, but there was a study done and respondents were asked this question of how many friends do you have that you could call on in a time of crisis? And the most common response was five. Five friends that I could call on in a time of crisis. Now this study was then done again a number of years later, more recently, and the same question was asked. How many friends do you have that you could call on in a time of crisis? And the average response, or the most common response, get this, zero, zero. No friends I could call on in a time of crisis. Now, now in the world, and I think particularly in the West, we struggle with community. We struggle with, with loneliness, with, with a sense of isolation. And so it is important as a church that we address this, this, this very important aspect of our life together, community. What does that mean for us? And that we recognize our deep need for one another and our deep need for the Lord. And I couldn't think of a better passage to, to wrestle through this issue of community then from Colossians chapter 3. So, so today we're going to look at God's word. It's Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. Colossians 3, 11 through 15. Listen now for God's word to us today. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free. But Christ is all and in all. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, you must also forgive one another. And above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you are called in one body and be thankful. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for this time together today. We thank you for your word and your spirit upon us to guide our hearts, to rule in our hearts. And Father God, I pray now that the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, Lord, would be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, that they would bring you joy, for indeed you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, there's an author, his name is Peter Block. He, he may be unfamiliar to you, probably is, but he has an intriguing book. It's called Community. Community, the Structure of Belonging. And he begins the book in this way. He, he says about community or about belonging, he says the, the, the essential challenge is to transform the isolation and self-interest within our communities into connectedness and into caring for the whole. And the, the key is to identify how that transformation occurs. But then, then he says something and this is what I want to kind of focus on for a moment. He says something that's really, really interesting. He says, we must begin 
by shifting our attention from the problem of community to the possibility of community. We must begin by shifting our attention from the problem of community to the possibility of community. Just, just consider that for a moment, right? What has to happen is we have to change our focus a bit. We, we tend to be, I think it's just a human thing, we tend to focus on the problems, right? And it's easy to pick out the problems. I've already mentioned some, right? People don't have friends they can call on in a time of crisis. We're, we're lonely, we're isolated. It's easy to find the problems. Same's true in the church, right? It's easy to find the problems in the church. But, but we shift our focus. He's saying we need to shift our focus from the problems, those are easy to identify, to the possibility, to the possibility of, of community. And I think in this passage from Colossians, that is also what the Apostle Paul is getting at, the possibility of community. And he's saying we really do have the possibility of genuine biblical community in Christ. We really have that. And, and you think about that. You think about that in light of who we are as a church, as a family of faith. We, we are a community that strives to model the love of God and all of the relationships we have with each other. And so when we talk about small groups or Bible studies or hospitality or how we're to relate to one another, all of this is a conversation about community. We're talking about community. And, and we are to be a community. We are to be a, a family of faith, strengthening each other through a healthy church life. And so to borrow from Peter Block's words, whether we're talking about the relationships we're called to have with, with other believers or if we're talking about the health of our marriages or our families, the question we have to get at is this. What affords us the possibility of genuine biblical community? What is it that gives us that possibility? I think that's the thing we need to look at today. And, and to do that, I, I'm gonna make three points, right? The old three points and a poem. No, I don't actually have a poem. Three points. And the first is this. What is it that affords us uh, the possibility of genuine biblical community? And I think the first is the reason for it. What's the, the reason for biblical community? And so the first thing to look at is that Paul, Paul gets at this. He, he talks about the reason we can have community. And to state it very simply for you, the reason that we can have genuine biblical community is because God gives that to us. He grants this to us. He makes it possible for us in Christ. In, in other words, community is a gift to us. It's a gift to us. And isn't that, isn't that wonderful? Isn't our, our heavenly father so wonderful that he would gift us in this way? He has given this to us in Jesus. It is ours. And, and I want to start, I'm going to start at the end of the passage. Don't ask me why, but I'm going to start at the end of the passage in verse 15. In verse 15, Paul says this. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. And we're going to focus on that part where it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And Paul here, he's talking about, he's talking about the objective reality of peace. And this is an objective reality that's been purchased for us by the shed blood of Jesus, that we have peace with God. And, and, and I, I say that an objective reality, because I think oftentimes when we talk about this sort of thing, we, we tend to kind of emotionalize it and we think about it subjectively, sort of how I feel at the moment. I feel very much at peace at the moment or I, I don't, right? We tend to sort of judge this by how we feel in any given moment. But what Paul is talking about is this objective reality of peace, that there's something, there's something that has been done for us. There is now a, a status or a state of being that is ours because of the atonement of Christ. He's done something for us. In fact, if you go back to the first chapter of Colossians, Paul deals with the preeminence of Christ. It's a wonderful chapter. And he talks about who Christ is and what Christ has done. And in verse 19, he says, in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And so he's helping us to understand the person of Christ, that he is the God man. And then he goes on in verse 20 and he says, through Christ, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on heaven 
or in earth, or whether on earth or in heaven, rather. And, and then we look at that last little section. He says, making peace by the blood of the cross. And so what he's talking about is that there is a reality of a world that lacks reconciliation, um, a world that is broken and strife-torn and sin-sick. And, and, and Paul is saying that then this, this broken world through the shed blood of Jesus, through the reconciling work of Jesus is, is then made right with God. That through Christ and his shed blood, we are reconciled to God. And, and you know, we, we talk this out. We talked this out a little bit. I mean, the, the main problem that, that humankind has is that we are broken. We are broken in our relationship with God. We are broken in our relationship with, with other people. We, we are fallen. We've walked away from God as human beings. And because of that, we, because we've turned our backs on God, because we've rebelled against God, then we're lacking something huge. We're lacking this relationship, this reconciled relationship with God. And, and, and Paul's saying what the cross of Christ provides for us is it provides us this reconciliation. It brings us into a re right relationship with God. It gives us peace with God. The biblical word for that peace is shalom. All things are right within us in our relationship with God. And, and, and then there's this you know, there, there's this linkage here that in Christ, as we trust in Christ, by, by his atoning work, we're made right with God. That's this vertical relationship. And then there's this wonderful gospel linkage that as, as we have this shalom with God, then we also have this horizontal peace. We then are able to begin to be at peace with one another, with our friends and um, and with, with relationships and with our family. We're, we're at peace with people around us. So we're reconciled to God. The objective reality of peace he's given us is that we're reconciled with God vertically and then we're reconciled with one another horizontally and we have, we have this peace. And, and you think about this, um, I think a good example is in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter two, it, it talks about this issue of people who formerly were hostile to one another, Jews and Gentiles, and how these formerly hostile people have now been brought into a relationship, a reconciled relationship with, with each other through the blood of Christ. They've been brought into one body, one family together. In Ephesians 2.14, we, we hear these words, it says, for he himself is our peace. Christ is our peace. He has made us one. In his flesh, he has broken down the dividing wall of hostility between people who did not get along, people who did not like each other. And, and that, that is the atonement that forges community. This is really foundational. And that's why when you look again at verse 15, what Paul is saying, he's saying we're called in this one body through this peace that we now have in Christ. We have community because of the reconciliation that we now have in Christ. And it saddens me. It saddens me like how, how little the church tends to focus on this, right? Because when we don't see these gospel linkages, how this horizontal reconciliation leads to this vertical and communal and social reconciliation, when, when you don't see that, when you don't push into that, when we don't grab hold of that, what happens is this, that, um, you, you know, we, we miss out on so much and we miss out on what Paul says. Paul says, we must let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. And that word rule, what it literally means is he's saying we must let the, the peace of Christ arbitrate in our hearts or referee in our hearts or guide our hearts. 
It's literally what it means. To let the peace of Christ, this reality that is ours, we're to let it guide how we think about and act in every relationship that we have. The relationship with our spouse, the relationship with our children, the relationship with our family, the relationship with our brothers and sisters in the church, the relationships with our neighbors. We're to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts in all of these relationships. And if we don't grasp hold of this, we miss out on something huge in community. But this is the peace of Christ, and it is ours. And he's saying it should rule in every relationship that we have. And and so that's by the work of Christ. By the work of Christ, we're we're able to, to live our lives in community together. And we're to let his peace guide and rule in our hearts and in our homes and in our church and in all of our relationships. And and so Paul gives us the reason we have for community. And it's because of the atoning work of Christ. He goes on though. And and the second second point I wanna make, and number two, he deals with the reality of biblical community. So we've seen the reason, now the reality. And if you notice in verse 11, he says, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free. But Christ is all and in all. So the first word there is here, and that is the first word I want us to notice, here. What's he talking about? It says, here there is, right? Well, well, here, here is related to something that's preceding it. And so I'm going to back up just a bit in the text. If we go back in chapter 3, the first two verses of chapter 3, he says, Paul says, if then you have been raised with Christ. If then you have been raised with Christ. So he's saying, there's this whole different world, this whole different reality that you live in if you have been raised in Christ, if you were in Christ, right? And he says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God and set your minds on things that are above and not on things of the earth. And, and so I think what he's saying is that that's where our citizenship is. We feel very rooted to this, to this world, but he's saying our, our citizenship is not here. It's above, it's in the heavenly, the heavenly things and the things of heaven. That's where our minds are to be set. And then if you look down to, or I don't know if it's on, oh yeah. yeah well, if you, in, in verse 10 in chapter three, this is right before our passage starts. In verse 10, 10, he then says, and you have put on the new self. You've put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of the creator. So we've put on this new self. And so when he says here, in verse 11, he says here, here there is. He's saying here in this new reality, there is renewal in Christ. There is this new world to us. There is this peace for us. And and, and so he says here, and then he goes on to talk about the ways that the ancient world would have really been divided, would have really been Uh, torn apart in turmoil and strife and divisiveness. Another way to put it is that the the ancient world, in the ancient world, they would not have known community. And and he says, here there is not. And that word not, it rests over each of these kind of comparisons. He says, here there is not Greek and Jew. There is not circumcised and uncircumcised. There's not barbarian and Scythian. There's not slave or free. And so he's talking about those things, those racial, religious, social, cultural distinctions that that the world was full of then and is still full of now um, that that cause strife and that cause turmoil and that cause a a lack of community. And, And what he's saying is that Here, in this new reality, as we have put on Christ, here, these things must not have the power to harm our Christian community. Now, let me clarify a few things so that you don't misunderstand me. 
Paul is not saying that there aren't distinct and different people in this new reality. He's not saying that. He, he's saying, in fact, or, or he's not saying that the churches aren't made up of Jew or Greek or circumcised or uncircumcised or barbarian or Scythian or slave or free. He's not saying that. As a matter of fact, the church was full of these people. And that's why he had to write this in the first place. Because there were people who were very different and they were struggling. They were struggling with how to come together in community. So there was this diversity, this great diversity of people in the church. And Paul's not denying that. And, and you know something else he's not denying? He, he's not denying that these were distinctively different people. They were. They brought different cultural persuasions, different understandings, different things they knew, different things they, they understood. And, and he's not denying that. I think, I think that was part of the problem that he understood, that in the church there were these very different people gathered together and they were struggling because these differences were real. And so he's not denying that. And so if he's not denying the diversity of different people, if he's not denying their uniqueness, then what's he getting at when he says there is not? Well, well what he is saying is that these things that distinguish people, these things that make different kinds of people distinct, He's saying these things are no longer ultimate. They are no longer ultimate. They can no longer have the ultimate weight that the world tends to give them. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this is part of the problem with our world today is that as we have walked away from God, as we've moved away from him, as we've rebelled against him, what we tend to do is we tend to make lesser things into ultimate things. We tend to make lesser things, even, even things that are good. There's a lot of good things that are lesser things, but we tend to make them into ultimate things. And as soon as we do that, we fall into this real, really man-centered trap where it's like, I'm different from you, and then I wanna kinda one-up you because my different is better than your different. And that, that's the trap that we fall into. It happens all the time in the world today. And so the scriptures do not deny that these differences exist. They do exist. The, these were real people coming out of their very real cultural context. And they were coming into the church. And Paul was saying that these things that make you different they, they are no longer ultimate. And in fact, they must be relativized if Christ is all and in all. He is then ultimate. And these things that make us different are not. And that means that, that all those things that make you in the world, it may be, may be your race, it may be your wealth, it may be your job, it may be where you live, it may be where you're from, that all these things that make you in the world He's saying that all of these things are no longer ultimate if Christ is all. He is ultimate. Now, that, that being true, that has to lead us to a conclusion that when we talk about community, community for us must not mean uniformity. It, it, community will not be established that way. It, uh, we're not establishing community if we just make a bubble and everybody's got to kind of be the, the same inside that bubble. We're, it's not community. We're not establishing community if we're just trying to force everyone to, to be uniform. That, that's not community. Here's how we have community. We have community when we together exalt Christ above everything else. Amen. Amen. We make Christ ultimate and we make Christ the greatest. That's how we establish community. And when this doesn't happen, and I mean many times this does not happen, 
when this doesn't happen, when we're not seeing these, these gospel connections vertically and horizontally, when, when we are not recognizing that the church is made up of distinct and very different people um, who are all about the business of Christ being all and in all. And I mean, guys, we're like, I mean, that's us. We're distinct and very different people. And praise God for that. That makes this church special, right? Um, but when we, if we choose to go the path of sameness, where everybody has to, to fit just the same, we will end up missing out on some glorious, some glorious things. And, um, and let, me, let me tell you, I think the biggest one, if we, if we try to force everybody to be the same, we'll miss out on the supernatural reality of community. This is really cool, right? That there's something about biblical community that is supernatural, that God has to do this, that God takes our strife-ridden and our overwhelmed world and he brings restoration and reconciliation into the brokenness, right? Into all the ways that we divide ourselves. That's God doing it. God, it's a supernatural thing. And, and, and if you notice in verse 12, you look at the language that Paul uses. He says, God's chosen ones, God's holy ones, God's beloved ones. You know, you know, that language is interesting because Paul didn't make up that language. That language is actually used all through the Old Testament. God's chosen ones, God's holy ones, God's beloved. I mean, who is that talking about in the Old Testament? Talking about God's people, right? It's talking about Israel. When you hear that in the Old Testament, the Jewish people. And, and over, over and over, hear Paul, this former Jewish Pharisee, this, this former religious zealot, all of a sudden, because, because Jesus got a hold of Paul, all of a sudden here, um, you know, there, there's this group of people that were far away. And now... Because of Christ, they've been brought near, right? And there's no longer Jew and Gentile and circumcised and uncircumcised and slave and free. All of them in Christ are now God's chosen, God's holy ones, God's beloved ones. And that is a supernatural work of God in community. To those who were once divided, to those who were once hostile toward one another, now God has brought them together in Christ. Amen. Yeah. Come on, y'all. Amen. Right? This is good stuff. And, and so that brings us to the last thing. So the reason we can have community is because of Christ and his reconciling work. The reality of community is that God can bring a, a diverse group of people together and they can now be his chosen ones, his holy ones, his beloved ones. And finally, what I want to look at is the responsibility that we all have to pursue community. So, so what this means is that community won't just happen. Wouldn't that be nice, right? It won't, but it won't just happen on its own. That's an interesting thing about the Bible. Uh, if you remember last week, last week we talked about godliness, right? And we established that God has given us everything that we need to live a godly life. But then Peter goes on to say, he then says, make every effort, make every effort to do these things. So it's like, you've been given everything you need. God has done this, but, but you need to pursue it. You have to, you have to put forth some effort for this to happen. And the same thing is going on today. The same thing is going on. We're talking about building today. We're talking about building community and, and, and we're saying, this is something that God has done, something there, there is a state of peace that God has granted to us in Christ, right? In Christ, he has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. But at the same time, it's almost as if he's saying, make every effort, right? We are now to live it out. We have a role in doing this, right? So we have this peace of Christ and community, but we've got, we've got to do it. We've been given everything we need 
to do it. And then we've got to pursue this thing together. And, and if we don't, if we don't put in that work, let me tell you what it's like. It's like this. Where are we? We're in January still, right? We're in January. So it's 11 months until Christmas. But think about this. This is what it's like. It's like if you went to, after church, if you go over to Oakland Mall, and you went to Oakland Mall and you said, there's something I really want. I don't know what that is, but think about something you really want for yourself. And so you said, after church today, I'm going to go to Oakland Mall and I'm going to buy that thing for myself that I really want. And it's going to be my Christmas present for next Christmas, 11 months away. And then you bring that thing, whatever it is, you bring it home. You've bought it for yourself. It is yours. You bring it home. You don't open the box. In fact, you wrap the box in wrapping paper and then you go to your closet and you put it in the top of your closet and you close the door and you put it away until Christmas time and you forget about it. And you almost in a way you reject that that thing is yours. And I think spiritually this happens way too often. If the Bible says that there is something that we now have that has been given to us that is ours, and in this case, that is peace, that is reconciliation with God and with one another. You know, the Bible says we have this. It is ours. But then you look around and you see churches falling apart, churches that are dividing, and you push that out further, you go into homes, even Christian homes, and you see marriages that are failing. You see relationships between parents and children that, that are struggling, falling apart. And we, have all, we see all of that, and you, might, and you might say, what is going on? I mean, we've been given this peace, yet there's all this division and brokenness. What is going on? And, and I only have one conclusion. And it's this, if the Bible is true, which I believe it is, and if Christ has done this, has reconciled us, which I believe he has, and then we look at the state of the church and we look at the state of many Christian homes and we see what's happening, then the only conclusion I can come to is we've got a whole lot of people who have taken this gift that is theirs of peace, of reconciliation, and they've not opened the box and they've put it up in the top of the closet and they've closed it and they've rejected it. Maybe I'll open it at Christmas in 11 months. But Paul says, these things need to be worked out. And he goes on to say this in verse 12 through 17. He says, put on then as God's chosen ones, as God's holy ones, as God's beloved, right? Earlier he says, put to death. Now he says, put it on. And the image is this. It's like you have a, a, a suit of clothes, a set of clothes, and, and they're dirty, and they're stained. And it's like they represent your sinfulness, your brokenness, your fallenness. And, and you're, wearing, you're wearing this suit of clothes and it's all over you. And, and the image is like you then take off that set of clothes, <clears throat> all of these sinful things, all of this brokenness that's defined your life, just kind of how you were before you came to Christ. And he's saying you, you take all of this off and, and then he says, you are to put on, right? You're then to put on like, like you're putting on a new set of garments, a new set of clothes. And, and, and this new set of clothes that we're to put on, it's these virtues that he goes on to talk about in verse 12. He says to put on compassionate hearts, to put on that garment of kindness, to put on humility and meekness and patience. Put put these things on. And let me just unpack those very, very quickly. These are kind of characteristics of social holiness, compassion. Now, literally and biblically, compassion is from the bowels of mercy, right? From the gut. We just, we just have something that wells out of us to, to care for other people, to be merciful to other people. Kindness, 
I mean, it's just being sensitive to others, having a genuine concern for others. He says, put on humility. I mean, humility is getting to the point where we just, I mean, we just disregard ourselves more in relationships. We don't always have to have the upper hand every time in every relationship. It just doesn't matter anymore. He says, put on meekness. That's just a gentleness that kind of gives allowance for others. He says, put on patience. You know, patience, it's just an enduring spirit. He says, put these things on. And then in verse 13, he goes on to say, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As as the Lord has forgiven you, you must also forgive. And so a couple of things here. Um, Paul, Paul's pretty clear. He's not talking about the Christian community being some kind of utopia, right? Being some kind of perfect thing. He's pretty clear. He's pretty honest about that. I think he's pretty honest. Like, it's going to be messy, right? I was, in fact, I was talking to somebody recently about ministry here at, at UCG, you know, and, and, and that was a struggle, you know? Like, I'm like, it's, it, ministry's messy, right? <laughs> I mean, it just, it just is. It is going to be. And we don't like that. But it's just how ministry is often going to be. Christian community is going to be messy, right? There are going to be times when, as Paul says, we're going to have to bear with one another. There are going to be times when you and I are just going to have to put up with people. We're just going to have to put up with each other because, we're, because we are in Christ together and we are family. And you know, when you're part of a family, I mean, there may be some people, you, you don't like them all the time but you're going to love them. You love them. You, you have mutual forbearance because you're in Christ together. Might not always like each other, but we're going to love each other in Christ. So we're going to bear with one another. And then he goes on to say, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. Just to say, community's messy. There are going to be times when someone, someone says something or does something that hurts you. They're going to do something they're not supposed to do and we're going to need to forgive them. We're going to need to forgive them. Or maybe we're going to have to learn to forgive. And then in verse 14, he says, above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. It's almost like, it's almost like that's the last part of the garment. The last part of the set of clothes, love. I don't know if it's the cap or the tie or the coat. This last part we put on is love. It's this sacrificial giving of ourselves to each other. Put on love. So as I close, I want, to, I want you to think about it this way. All of these qualities, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, love. Where are those found to perfection? Or in whom are those found in perfection? Come on. In Christ. Thank you. In Christ. Most of the time, they're just like rhetorical questions. Sometimes, you know, and make sure you're awake. Um, they're found to perfection in Christ. They are not found to perfection in Mark, right? I have a lot of work to do on all of these. They're not found to perfection in you. No offense, right? But they are found in perfection in Christ. Amen. Yeah. So that when Paul says these things, we need to put these things on, I think what what he's driving at is this, that that if we want to have community, if we want to have genuine biblical community, we got to know Jesus. We got to be walking with Jesus. We got to be trusting Jesus, right? That the character, the character that is Jesus has to become more and more the character that is Mark, right? Or the character that is you, or the character that is you, or the character that is you back there. His character, we need to press into him in faith and his character needs to be become more and more our character.
And that comes through a relationship with him, a living, active relationship with him. It comes through spending time with him. It comes through spending time in his word. It's one of the most important things we can do. It comes through the grace of being together in worship. This is the most important, one of the most important things we could be doing this week here together in worship, the grace of worship. It comes through being in prayer. It comes through the fellowship of Christian community, that the character of Christ would begin to shape you and mold you, I mean, like a virus infect you, replicate in you. And then and only then will we have the community that God has called us to have. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for this time together today in your word. We're so thankful for the reminder of what you have done for us in Christ. And we pray today, Father, that you would forgive us for the ways that we ignore your work. Forgive us the ways in which we ignore your power. Forgive us the ways in which we ignore who you are and what you have called us to do in pursuing community together. And we ask today, Lord, that you would help us to grow in you, that the character that is Christ would become more and more the character inside each one of us, and that we would have that peace of Christ to rule in our hearts and in our church and in our relationships and in our homes and in every aspect of our life. And Father God, we may not always like each other, but we pray that we would love one another deeply because we are in your family as we trust in you. And so we thank you. And in your name we do pray. Amen.